Today we are testing out the Holbein 18 color watercolor set that I picked up from Amazon. You guys can check out the unboxing swatch by clicking here and I'm gonna paint this adorable flower crown cutie. So keep watching. Today we're doing the Holbein field test. I did a little bit of pre-test painting for my Valentine illustration and you guys can check out the little weird time lapse for that by clicking the card here. But this is going to be the full um, spoken field test. So I hope you guys find this useful and helpful. I have a selection of paints and brushes, and I am painting on Bocking Ford cellulose based watercolor paper. So, the first thing I want to do, I always seem to do blue backgrounds, and I think it's because the color is just so pretty and it's very relaxing. Although, apparently, like pre Middle Ages, blue was associated with like the devil because it was the color of the night. Isn't that funny how we went from like blue is a peaceful color that we paint in like mental health wards to make people feel calm and soothe. And then before that it was, it's the color of the devil. I always love how drastically some things change. Like blue used to be for little girls and pink because it's a softer form of red used to be for little boys. And I'm not really a big fan of like gender color coding your child. <laughs> but when I'm, a, I was a kid in the nineties, which means all of the toys by that time period were like for girls were like pink and fuchsia and really tacky looking. And I had this uh, phase where I would look through like old Sears catalogs online. Cause I like seeing how toys have evolved and what stayed with us. And I felt this big pang of jealousy because like the kitchen sets, for kids in the 70s were like red and blue and like kind of like colored like a real kitchen might be except a little more primary so they weren't gender coded as much and the images the ads showed kids of both genders playing with them that's really prevalent in the 80s too and i would really i really miss those days i still wander down the to toy aisle when i have free time if i'm in target and i'm still kind of bummed out by all the gender color coding just because it's kind of boring. Like if you don't like those colors, that kind of sucks for you. All right, so we've got this first layer done. I'm gonna let this dry, but I'm gonna grab a little bit and I have a color map to help me. Oh, that turned out to be purple. I have a color map to help me out. A little bit of indigo. I'm just gonna quickly shade her eyes and her mouth. And I wish I had some paper towels because I want to kind of clean up her eyes. What I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to gently bring this color down. And then once I finish with the background, I'm going to use a bulldog clamp to clamp it shut since this isn't on a block and it is prone to buckling and that'll kind of solve the buckling problem. All right, that first layer has dried. Bockingford I've found dries kind of quick, which can be a good thing. And it's a nice thick, sturdier paper too. So I am going to darken up certain areas just to kind of ground. I mean, she already looks kind of grounded on the picture plane, which is nice. That's one of the reasons why I'll do a background of some sort. And something that I really like about these Holbein paints, I've used Holbein paints um, piecemeal over the years, their neutral tint is one of my very favorite colors, to be honest. It's a beautiful purple-blue, very dark. It's great for shadow colors. Um, just goes with like everything, right? It really makes, it is a very convenient convenience color because it really works well with anything but yellow. And yellow is always kind of a weird one to shade anyway. But with their normal line, I'm finding, so I've, I've used their Iridori line for years, um, but with their normal range, I'm finding the colors are very bright and um, a little saturated, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's very different from how I typically paint. So I take some getting used to. So like I said in the unboxing swatch, if you're the sort of artist who loves bright colors and there's nothing wrong with that, then these might be a great 
first set for you. Or maybe you want to upgrade to a professional set. This could be a good first professional set for you or last professional set. Like I'm not saying, I'm not saying it has to be your only. I'm just saying that they're affordably priced over on Amazon for the little five milliliter tubes. So um, it's inexpensive enough that somebody who isn't necessarily sure they want to be into watercolor can uh, get into and kind of dabble with. And the colors are bright enough that even if you don't care, I mean, you can make them lighter, obviously, by adding lots of water like we're doing here. But if you want really saturated, more bang for your buck kind of colors, you only want to do one layer. These can be really good for that. So I think once this blue has dried, I'm going to grab a bulldog clip and go ahead and secure this down. And I may have put too much blue in her eyes. We'll find out. So the paper is still a little damp, not so much at the top, but at the bottom. And I know if I put this on damp paper, it will probably bruise or cause discoloration. That's okay. We're doing a field test or rather a, yeah, we're doing a field test. So not such a big deal. Okay. So normally I mix my own skin tone using yellow ochre and a little bit of scarlet red. And I do have those colors in this set, but I'm gonna use the included, I think it's Jean Brilliant, but I might be wrong. I'd have to double check. Um, it's basically like a peachy kind of color that can be used as skin tones. It's probably intended to be used for skin. I, again, prefer mixing my own. And I think this color is a little opaque for what I normally like to do, but I'm going to try to do this field test as though I were someone who would use the set for that. So I'm going to go ahead and use the skin tone is basically what I'm laboriously dancing around saying. And I've gone ahead and I've watered it down a lot because you really want to work with this in a thin capacity. You don't want to apply it like it's gouache. And it, in case you guys did not see the unboxing swatch, which you should, cause it's good. Um, I went ahead and I swatched colors both straight from the pan and then, I mean, straight from the tube and then in a half pan situation like this. And I typically work with dried out paints in a half pan because it's easier for me to work with. It takes up less space. I find I get less paint waste. So that's how I like to work. Um, the colors are definitely more brilliant if you work directly from the tube. So if you're looking for something that's really gonna stand out, is really saturated, then go ahead and work from the tube. These colors are beautiful from the tube as well. Okay, so I also left some of the white of the paper. It's something I've been trying to do a little bit more because it has nice visual bounce when you do that. Just trying to knock some of the excess water out and then I'm just gonna very lightly, because I don't wanna lose that optical bounce, very lightly blend some areas. Grab a little bit more. I'm just gonna go ahead and add a little more color wet into wet so it'll diffuse nicely on her neck. And then I'll let this dry. All right, so as it is, I actually think the color looks really pretty like that. Now, normally I want to render it a little bit more. I think that's kind of growing up with Western children's books. The, the ones that were watercolor tended to be very rendered, like Animalia was very rendered. Um, I am gonna try to have a lighter hand with this, mostly because I know opaque colors don't take glazing super well. So doing a shadow color over this might ruin it. And I also had a little bit of experience with that when I did the Valentine illustration. So I am going to add a little bit, oh, running out of my color here. Little bit of color over her eyes. So this sort of, this sort of skin tone can be great if you paint a lot of Caucasian or light skin people, Asian people. Um, but it can be frustrating because the brown is an okay brown for skin tones. But if you're looking for like a one-stop color, one, 
I can't talk today. <laughs> like a one-stop shop for your color if you want just one tube to be your skin tone. I mean, I usually try to stay away from those in general. It doesn't really suit my work very well. So this is, can be great as like a quick way to knock some color in, sort of generic color in, but it can be frustrating if you wanna paint a variety of skin tones. If you're relying on this color, you don't have to rely on this color. If when I use this set in a non field test capacity, I don't really use that color at all. Um, just because it's not even like, even my skin is not, well, I guess it, it kind of is, but <laughs> I was thinking it was, I was thinking I was a little more yellow than that. But in general, this is not most people's skin tones. And I'm gonna give her a really bright green for her eyes. So I'm gonna start with this green way over here. And I'm gonna paint the unusual, I'm gonna make her blonde. Mostly because I don't really paint a lot of blonde people. But that's gonna come up much later. All right, so I'm gonna give those a chance to dry. All right, so her skin is dry. I am gonna grab some of this Scarlet. And I kind of learned from doing the Valentine the other night that I'll actually show you guys. You see how her cheeks, really her knees, it's kind of like dried blood color. That is the color I got from using this. And even when I mixed it with Scarlet, it was still not a good fit. So we're gonna try some scarlet. I was thinking, because usually when I do blush, um, scarlet's a little intense. So that's why I avoided doing it. And a little bit underneath the chin. Now I really, really wish I had my paper towels handy because I want to blend and to do that, I want to knock most of the water off the brush. And although St. Cuthbert's is a cellulose-based paper, it's a nicer cellulose-based paper, so it can stay open a little bit longer than some of the cheaper ones, and it's also thicker and has like a kind of pronounced texture. So I'm gonna give this a chance to dry. So that's had time to dry. And I think it actually looks really nice on her skin like this. I'm gonna go a little bit darker in some areas, but otherwise the uh, scarlet red goes really nicely over the peach sort of skin tone. And then I'm gonna blend out the cheeks just a little bit, but I'm gonna leave the lips kind of as they are. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna add another layer of green to her eyes. I'm gonna use a slightly darker green. And I'm going to kinda just paint the irises and then leave the rest unpainted. Oh, she's looking really cute, actually. I might do some more illustrations in this style. And then I'm gonna grab some of this cool blue and I'm just gonna dot it at the bottom of her eyes and let it blend. It's not quite as cute, but hopefully it will dry nice. So I wanted her to be blonde and when mixing up blondes, I usually try to avoid going straight yellow since blonde hair is not really, it is yellow, but it's softer kind of like butter to straw or even platinum, so very light. We're gonna go with like a mid-range. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix some yellows together with yellow ochre and then use some of the browns to help shade it. So I can't just use my Fiskars craft mat for that because I need to mix up a sizable amount and I want it to be consistent. So I'm gonna go get a little tray. So after I filled up a little cup for water, I realized I completely missed her ear. Now, one of the nice things about working with a pre-mixed color for skin is it's really not a lot of effort to go back in and fix that. The color's already been mixed. I just need to match it um, in saturation and that can be done in layers. It doesn't have to be done all at the same time. 
I also realize that if you're an urban sketcher, working with premixed colors like this can be hugely helpful because you're not spending that time mixing up skin tones. And while it may not seem like a lot of time, I know as somebody who <laughs> mixes up a lot of skin tones, it does add up, it does add time to my painting. And it, there's a space consideration too because I need room to mix up the skin tone. So while I'm here, I'm just gonna darken some things up actually. Doesn't this always seem like whenever I, I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna do like three things. I end up doing like 10 things and then it ends up kind of messing the whole thing up. So I ended up adding kind of a lot of additional color. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just kind of changes the overall skin tone a little bit. And then while I wait for that to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing the hair color. So I'm gonna grab some of this really light, cool yellow. And then some of this warmer, more golden yellow. And that can be our lightest shade. And as I continue to mix for darker, I can just add it to this cup. So I'm gonna let this dry and then I'll paint her hair. So that has dried. I am going to select a brush. I'm gonna grab a small one and also keep working with my nice, actually this one might be a good all purpose. But we're gonna just start filling in her hair since this is the lightest color we're gonna use. This is gonna be our highlight. And it really is handy. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change my normal working methods, but it really is handy to be able to work from a pre-mixed skin tone. I may have to do another of these little field tests with somebody with darker skin and see if some of the browns, cause they, the browns are actually, like this one here is a really lovely color. This one's also very nice. So we might actually have a good three pre-mixed skin tones, which could be really, really handy because then you're really just like tinting the colors in order to get something more specific. And she's turning out so cute. They were like, it would actually be a lot of fun to do maybe three flower crown girls with different skin tones. And then we would also know how well they work as skin tones. It's a lot of work, but it is also sounding like a good idea. And I love selling the originals. So that would also give me three really cute originals to sell. Speaking of, if there's ever an original ever a piece you see me create on this channel that you're interested in, you can email me to find out if it's available. It probably is. Um, I've meant to set up an Etsy shop just for selling originals for a while and I just have never gotten around to doing so. So I'm gonna mix a couple of these darker reds together. And I'm gonna go ahead and start filling in her mouth. I think I mentioned in the unbox and swatch, but if you are an artist who enjoys doing watercolors at conventions, and I, I used to be, and I just can't because people will come back every 10 minutes and ask if their piece is finished. And that's just like, it's watercolor. It takes 10 minutes to dry, come on. But if you enjoy doing watercolors at conventions, this might actually be a very good set for that. Since the skin tone, maybe possibly three skin tones are already mixed. So it gives you a pretty, pretty good range. Okay, so I want her hair to be darker than this. So I'm gonna grab a lot of the buttery yellow. Now I could work directly and I would get a more, a, a quicker saturation, but I want a little more consistency than I think I'd be able to get. I'm also gonna grab some of the yellow ochre and start mixing in, oh yeah, set. So the yellow ochre in this set is a very warm, buttery yellow ochre. I'll give the hair a chance to dry and then I will get back to that. All right, so that is mostly dry. I'm gonna go in now and start the next layer. 
Oh, I may not have mixed it quite saturated enough. That's okay. That's what future layers are for. Now I'm gonna leave some of that light yellow visible, probably not as much as I should, but I also am finding there isn't quite as much contrast, so I really need to build up the next layer because otherwise it's just gonna, there's just not gonna be a lot of bounce. And we have a good amount of bounce in her face. I lost some of it when I did her ear and I kind of added additional color. But if I were doing this again, I could leave a little more bounce. And when I say bounce, I really mean just visual contrast. So the lightness of the prior layer or the whiteness of the paper as contrasted against the next layer we're putting on. People think of watercolor as being very, very pastel, and it can be, but if you want vibrant, dynamic paintings, then you really want a little more contrast. Now, I'm not always the best at leaving enough contrast, but it is something I think about, and it is something I'm working on improving. Now, I'll start doing the more finicky smaller areas up here. And this would be quite a bit more in shadow because she has that flower crown that would be casting some shadow. Okay, now I wanna mix that color a lot more. Well, rather, I wanna make that color more saturated. So I'm gonna grab a lot more of the yellow ochre. And we might even be to the point where I want to work just with the warm yellow and the yellow ochre because I may not be able to get it quite as saturated as I would like with all this water that I've already added in. So I'll let that dry and I'll check on it in a bit. Let's see if this layer isn't a little bit better. It is, it is. All right, that's good. And I usually like to start, if I'm testing out a color, if I'm basically swatching it on the paper, I like to test it in an area that's going to be in shadow. That way, if it's not quite right, it's kind of easier to fix it than if I used it in an area where it would be like the final layer. Kind of, kind of hard to fix that once you've goofed that up. And these colors have been, I don't even have to activate them. In fact, um, I feel like if I did activate them by like dropping some water on them, they might start to melt because they came from two watercolors and they never really dried out 100%, which is fine. Um, they're dry enough that I could, I'd feel confident traveling with them and I don't think they would immediately ooze out of the half pans, but they're still liquidy enough that I don't want to add a lot of water to the half pans just because they'll start to melt again. And I think after this layer, I can start working directly from those half pans. I also think after this layer, maybe even during this layer, I can start working on developing the eyebrows a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna grab, do it right here, some of that yellow ochre and a little bit of that warm yellow and like I just told you guys we're going to start in the shadows and I'm kind of working wet into wet but the paper has absorbed most of the water so with the Bockingford paper it's not like cotton rag in that um, it is a little more workable than most cellulose papers but it doesn't stay wet and blendy for as long as cotton rag papers usually will stay. So blend that out using some of the previously mixed color. Do the same over here. Want to do that over here as well. I think we're getting decent contrast now. There. 
and then the same thing over here. And then I'm gonna need to go into all those nooks and crannies. And this will be a good test also to see if these colors have a little bit of optical brightener or uh, some white added to make them more vibrant or if they're truly vibrant and translucent. And the way we're gonna be able to tell that is how much they obscure the line art. How gray is that line art gonna get? And so far it's looking good. It's a little hard to work around now. So I'm gonna try not to get out of lines too much. Oh, see, rested my hand there in something still wet. And you wanna be careful about that because it's gonna get all over the place. All right, so I'm gonna let that dry before I tighten it up even further. Okay, so this has had time to dry. I think I'm going to use a lot of the yellow ochre and I'll just go ahead and mix that in right there. And like I said before, it's a really nice yellow ochre, rich and fairly saturated. Some yellow ochres are pretty desaturated in color, which depending on how you paint or what kind of things you like to paint could be useful. But for me, the nice warm saturated yellow ochres are pretty useful. And I've just been using, kind of rinsing the yellow ochre off into that mixture, the yellow, like the blonde mixture I mixed earlier. That way I'm kind of, slightly darkening that color. And I'm also blending out with a color that will work rather than just water, adding a little bit of extra color in there. Go ahead and darken that. And I may have to come back around and let it dry. Oh, see, I rested my hand in still wet paint. Now I'm gonna working that blonde color I mixed earlier in, darkening some colors so that it makes a little more sense visually. Right, looking, looking pretty good. Now to let that dry. Okay, I think the hair is looking pretty good. I'm gonna grab some of this lovely brown and mix it in here. And just use this to kind of add a little more shadow to the braids. And these squirrel brushes will get a little bit floppy. So I like to rotate them, it sort of helps. We find a nice sharp point so I can pull nice details. Then I'm gonna do that here under the flowers as well. And this is a little bit different from my normal rendering techniques, but I think it's good to experiment. Try out other people's styles. Try out things you've seen other people do that work for them to kind of expand your repertoire. It gives you some new options and maybe you'll discover something you like better. So the brown is a little overwhelming in some of these areas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in with the yellow ochre and soften it a little bit. And it doesn't soften it by lightening it. It just makes everything makes it a little more congruous with what's around it, makes it fit in a little bit better. Now, since the yellow ochre is slightly opaque, it will also help tone that brown down just a little bit. But as you guys can see, like here in her bangs, the brown's a little bit abrupt, so. Doing this will sort of 
tie it together a little bit better. Now I have a bad tendency of when I start really light, I end up getting really, really dark. I, I don't know when to stop, I guess. So I'm going to have to stop myself from doing too much. I'm gonna end up losing what I have. So I'm gonna hit Control S, just kidding. Uh, I'm gonna let it dry. And then we can start it on the ribbons and on some of the leaves. So this has had plenty of time to dry. I'm going to start with some scarlet and I'm gonna paint the ribbons. I may have to switch brushes, this might be too floppy. All floppy and no dope. And as you guys can imagine, the scarlet is really just a base coat. I want nice bright red ribbons because it's kind of like a nice May Day sort of spring illustration. And I left the white reflection so these would read more as like shiny satin ribbons. Now, next I'm gonna grab some green. And I'm gonna do kind of a base coat on the leaves because I want them to be a little more green, like a blue-green than her eyes. This actually makes me wanna do a top layer on her eyes. So I will probably go back and do it, but I love I love how even with just one layer, you can get really nice chroma, nice saturation. A while back, I did a one layer watercolor tutorial using my Winsor & Newton half pans, and I just couldn't get this kind of color saturation. So I kind of want to go back and do a one layer watercolor with these. Like these would be really ideal. I think I may have mentioned this earlier, but these would be really ideal for watercolors who are kind of one and done. They want to do, or watercolor comic people who want to do one layer of watercolor and then that's that's that because they're really nice you can get an intense color almost immediately so they're very rewarding in that aspect that aspect I mean you can get nice saturation without them being goopy all right so Grab some green, mix it in with just a little bit of blue. And we're gonna get to the tops of the eyes here. I think adding that little bit of green shadow helps. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill in her mouth with the darker red. Cause I didn't get quite, it, there's good saturation but it's not quite as dark as I would have liked. And I'm gonna add some of that so we can get a darker red. Y'all might not believe how ridiculous this is, but it wasn't until I was messing around with the Crayola blending set, which is basically just Crayola markers, I mean, Crayola watercolors, sorry, um, with like not even two yellows, one yellow, two reds, two blues. Um, and hopefully I'll have that for you guys eventually. It's recorded. <laughs> um, anyway, it wasn't until I was messing around with that set that I realized that you can get like a nice middle ground red by mixing your cool red with your warm red. I know, how ridiculous is that? I'm sure that's true for all the other colors, but I'd never really like thought about it that much. I'd like layered them like this, but I didn't try mixing them together in a weld palette. Sometimes the really elementary things you'll learn when you're doing <laughs> art supply reviews of kid grade products, it really forces you to kind of get back to basics and learn how to deal with what you've got and how to problem solve for things that will really throw up a lot of errors. I don't know. I thought that was kind of funny but also kind of cool because it goes to show that you could you can literally paint literally paint every single day and still learn something so elementary 
And it's the elementary stuff that I think we, we, when we're teaching other people how to do things, I think that's one of the things we really neglect to cover. And so I know for me, my fundamentals are, I feel like they're kind of shaky sometimes because um, I'd already had a lot of background in art and in painting, but not necessarily specifically in watercolor and certainly not a lot of like one-on-one -on -one instruction, for example. So sometimes the things I, that are really basic to other people are news to me and I'm forever trying to fill that in, fill in those blanks with information from books and from YouTube. All right, I'm gonna grab some Viridian Green now. Start adding a little bit. See how nice and cool and shadowy that Viridian Green is? It just really gives, a, I think, a very fun, very cartoony look, which I, I think that's great. Like, I know the cartoony style, especially in this kind of style, isn't necessarily very popular anymore, and that breaks my heart because I love it. I think it's the best style, but uh, if that is a look that you like, these watercolors can be really great for that. Adding a little bit to her eyes. Twisting it to get the best angle possible. She's really starting to come together, I think. Maybe add a little more red now that we've got like a true red. A little red. Of course, there's still some green in my brush, unfortunately. So that kind of desaturated the red a bit. I'll just blend that out. I'm tempted to use my shirt to pick it up because I still don't have a paper towel. What is wrong with me? And I'll let that dry. All right, that's all looking pretty good. It's time to start painting in the flowers. So I think I want to do, I know I want more blue in here because right now it's there's a lot of yellow, a lot of red, a lot of green. It's kind of Christmassy. Um, so... These are anemones and I was gonna do them probably red, but I think to help balance, although the background's blue, hmm. Decisions, decisions. Well, what I can do is I can paint the centers, start them out with, oh, that's purple, not blue. That'll be fine. I'll just mix them together. So I've got indigo and purple mixed together. And then if it's not dark enough, I can use a little bit of black on the inside. I could even dab it in now wet into wet and kind of take advantage and let it naturally blend. So maybe I will even do that. Okay, and then I need something for the daisies. Oh, I didn't do this little one. Let me actually water it down a little so it's not so intense. And then dab a little bit of purple in there. Looking good so far. So I will think about what I wanna do with the daisy shape. Maybe I should do a purple with those and make them look like cone flowers. So I grabbed some dark red. And then I'm gonna use a light purple and maybe even mix some pink in with it. And given how saturated these paints are and how which is nice the color is, it actually makes me want to leave more of the paper rather than covering more of the paper. I think it's because there's like a lot of really nice contrast between, got some in the center there, between the colors themselves and the paper. And um, you know how watercolor dries a little bit lighter than it goes down? Well, these dry, and they still dry a little lighter, but not as light as some colors. Like some colors, there is really dramatic color shift and it's always disappointing to see the dry version versus the wet version because the dry version is just so 
so much less vibrant. But these do an excellent job of keeping that vibrancy. So if you, if one of the reasons why you never really enjoyed watercolor, for example, is because of that disappointing color shift, these don't have quite as much of a color shift. And not that these are cheap watercolors. Holbein is an excellent brand. Um, it just, it's cheaper here in the U.S. or you can get it fairly cheap depending on where you get it from because it's not very popular. Unfortunately, you're going to have, you may have trouble finding it. Um, I know Jerry's Artorama, at least in the national area, carries the acrylic wash, which is there. It's, it's just acrylic paint probably because it's an, ac an acrylic based wash. And, right. Um, but I don't think they ca carry the tubes of Holbein paint. I know Dick Blick does because I used to buy the Iridori colors on Dick, through Dick Blick. So you can get it there. Um, and I got these off of Amazon, but you can't get, well, maybe you can get the piecemeal colors off of Amazon now that I think about it, but you're probably going to be paying a little bit extra. So I'm going to let those beautiful purple flowers dry. And then we're going to start working on the anemones. So while I've still got my purple mostly mixed, I'm going to add a little bit more. And then I'm going to do another layer since I've already got this going on. And these little binder clips that I'm using to hold it down are doing a good job holding it down, but they're also kind of affecting my ability to pull nice. I mention this every time, don't I? I don't know. I just think it's worth mentioning so that if you're seeing what I'm doing and then you're trying to do it and you're like, oh, those clips are always in the way. Yeah, they're, they're always in the way. I even use clips when I've stretched the paper because it helps hold it a little more secure. I know, I know a couple of artists who will use staples to hold it down. Um, and that's a good idea. I just don't want to chew through my gator board like that. I'm probably just being cheap. I even know people who stretch their watercolor paper on foam core and use staples and they just replace it as they go. So those are all options. If you got the money for that, might be worth exploring. Oh, keep dipping into purple when I think I'm dipping into indigo. I'm just gonna grab some indigo and some blue. These sort of craft mats, they're marketed to crafters, but they're really handy for artists too because I can just mix my color on there. So instead of dirtying a daisy palette in order to mix up colors, and this is nice because it's got a textured surface. So I used to use an Ink Essentials craft sheet and it's very slick and it's, it's good for its own, in its own way. But this is nice because I can drag the paint off my brush onto this. All right, let that dry. So I think I want to do those anemones in red. I'm going to try to do a cooler, lighter red though. And that way it won't be too similar with her ribbons. These are fun though. These are fun paints, especially when I discovered that I really like all the bounce I can get and how saturated the color is. That really made me like them. These also seem like they might be good paints on cheap papers. Sometimes it can be hard to find paints that really shine on cheap papers. Like Daniel Smith, like everybody, or rather lots of people like Daniel Smith, right? They're really good high quality watercolors. However, they don't look very good on cellulose papers. I know, I know. There's an old adage, fine feathers for fine birds. And I kind of hate that adage because it has been used to push makeup I didn't want on me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, finding, not everybody can afford cotton rag paper. Not everybody likes painting on it, to be honest. And sometimes it just won't work for what you're trying to do. So finding paints that work really well on cheaper papers, but still have the archival pro properties that um, will make them last the test of time, will make them ideal for like commission work or selling your originals. That can be really, that's really important to me at least. Um, and it's important 
to help you, for me to help you guys, those of you who are interested in finding these things, to be able to find them. Because it's not necessarily something that gets talked about a whole lot. And those of you who watch this channel and read my webcomic know that I use both really nice papers and really cheap, <laughs> kind of gross papers. So these paints could be a real delight for brushes that have a lot of snap because you can get a lot of neat, loose brushwork. Oh, I bet these would be really nice for those people who enjoy doing those loose floral paintings too because they're so saturated. And a little bit even goes a long way, which is also really nice. Now I'm getting all over. I'm, I am making a mess in getting paint in places I don't want paint to be. Goofatron tonight. I'm gonna water this down and do a really light handed, hopefully. Render here on this bottom flower. Here we go. That's looking really pretty. I'm gonna grab a little more saturated color. While this is wet, dab it in so we can get some nice wet into wet. Looking pretty good. So I'm gonna let that dry. All right, so we are almost done. Did wanna point out how muddy my watercolor water is, or rather how opaque it is. Um, we did do a fair bit of work, but I don't necessarily think we did as, I don't think we did enough to justify how muddy it is. That's usually how muddy it gets after I've been painting three pages or four pages at a time. So what that does tell me is there are some optical brighteners added. Chalk, talc, could be zinc oxide, all sorts of things go into optical brighteners. It just makes the colors a little more opaque, pop a little bit better. It can make the colors a little more muddy. I haven't noticed that with this yet, but I also haven't done um, quite the same sort of testing I would normally do if that makes sense. Those of you who've watched my other field tests know what I'm talking about probably. I've painted to the strengths of these paints, which is great. Um, there's gonna be people who this will really help, but it doesn't necessarily test whether these paints are gonna get muddy if you layer them, um, those sort of problems. So unfortunately for me, I may have to do another test to figure out whether or not these are the sort of paints that will also get muddy. Maybe not, maybe they're just very vibrant. Maybe they found an optical brightener that um, can be layered and it won't turn to mud. I don't really, I don't know until I test. All right, so I am almost done, but I did want to go into her eyebrows, or eyelashes, sorry, and do a layer of very light brown. And it's so light you can almost not even see it, but I think it helps sort of tie everything together. So I'm gonna grab a little bit of purple. And then once that dries, I'm gonna go into the daisies. Well, they're really more asters. <laughs> and I'm going to use a little bit of the warmer yellow. And then, and then, and then, we're gonna pull out our bleed proof white and do some highlights. Oh, you know what? Let me grab some light brown. Kinda did her freckles. And do another layer on her ear, let that dry and do a little pink on the inside. But yeah, she's looking pretty cute. I think someone is gonna be happy to give her a nice home. So now I wanna add a little bit of pink, just a little to the ear, just to let it kinda 
looks like it's attached to her and it wasn't a, a tack on job. And now I think it's just time for the bleed proof white. And I'm gonna use a stiffer bristle brush for this. And I'm just adding a few highlights here and there. Oh, and I said I was gonna add a little bit of orange. Well, warm yellow to the center. Awesome. All right. So I think we're done. So I like this set. I like the color selection. I even like the convenience of having a pre-mixed skin tone. I would like to go and do field tests with both of the darker browns as well and see how those stand up as standalone skin tones. And I still need to do some sort of field test where we layer color, layer, layer, layer to see if it lifts to see if it gets muddy. So unfortunately, to do something a little more definitive is gonna require a lot more work. But if this looks good to you, if this looks like the sort of stuff you might wanna do, then I can definitely vouch for the Holbein 18 color watercolor set. You can find a link in the description below on where you can get it from Amazon. That's the best price I have found and it helps me and my channel out. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please let me know in the comments. It always means a lot to hear from you guys. I don't always get a chance to respond, but I do read your comments and they do really mean a lot to me. And if you have any specific questions, you can either ask me in the description or in the comments below, or you can head on over to natosoup.blogspot.com and check out my watercolor basics series. It is a series of watercolor tutorials designed, really it's designed for comic people, but there's a lot of very basic stuff in there. So it could be great if you want to do illustration or you want to pick up watercolor in a very casual way. And I cover everything I can think of. So there's lots of information there. And if you enjoyed this, make sure you check out some of my other watercolor tutorials here on this channel. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys had a great day. And if you like watercolor, why don't you head on over to 7inchcara.com or 7 inchcaratumblrcom my beautiful watercolor webcomic. It's free to read and check that out as well. So I hope you guys have a great day. Bye!